here immediately. Uh, the image in the New England region, which looks really disgusting, is painless. And it's been present for several years and seems to be growing fairly slowly. Uh, we're given a variety of options. Dermoid cysts are teratomas. I don't think that they occur on the tongue to my knowledge. Oral candidiasis, thrush in English looks entirely different. This does not look like a freely movable lesion and it's in part also ulcerated, so lipoma is not my choice. Uh, this is not a mucosal, so the only thing that's left is spindle cell sarcoma of the tongue. And uh, if you're in doubt, always pick the most malignant lesion. And uh, in this case, we're correct. This is a spindle cell sarcoma of the tongue. Uh, uh, dermoid cysts are uh, teratomas. Uh, they commonly also build teeth and hair and nails and things of this nature. They're malignant, uh, but not very. Uh, they're common um, in uh, the ovary and also the testis, also confined to other areas. I'm not aware that they occur on the tongue. Uh, this is thrush. This is a candida albicans uh, uh, infection common in people that are immunosuppressed or in uh, infants and small children. Lipomas are benign fatty tumors. They're freely movable. They're painless. They are in basically not a problem and hardly ever degenerate to malignancy. Uh, spindle cell uh, sarcomas are basically fibroblasts and have this uh, spindle appearance as we see here. They're uncommon in humans, but common in uh, other animals. Uh, the example shown here is a spindle cell sarcoma uh, on the hind limb of a dog. Sarcomas are labeled in terms of the cell type that they represent. Uh, rhabdomyosarcomas, muscle-like uh, cells, leiomyosarcomas are smooth muscle, Liposarcomas are fat cells. Fibrosarcomas would include this particular lesion, angiosarcomas, etc. Uh, mucoceles involve salivary glands, and here is a an example of a mucoceal uh, on the tongue. Uh, the the first topic in the New England Journal concerns thromboembolism in cancer patients. Uh, these can occur with a variety of tumors. The most common are listed here, stomach, pancreas, lung, lymphoma, gynecological cancers, bladder, testicular, and other. Uh, there's a risk scale, and individuals that have a Corana score greater than two uh, should probably receive anticoagulation, and then there's debate as to which kind of anticoagulant should be used. Uh, warfarin obviously has disadvantages uh, injecting low molecular weight heparin is sometimes employed, but that also has problems. And perhaps uh, orally active anti-10A inhibitors would give a better result. And indeed, in the first study that we look at, a pixaban to prevent venous thromboembolism in patients with cancer. Uh, here, patients with a variety of tumors that had a Corana score of two or greater were randomized to apixaban compared to placebo. The primary efficacy outcome was documented venous thromboembolism over a period of six months, and the major safety outcome was bleeding. And if we look at this, the patients were average 61 years of age, about half were women, uh, gynecological cancers, lymphomas, pancreatic cancers, uh, and others were represented. Some of these patients had received antiplatelet drugs from their physicians, but uh, these uh, confounding variables were equally distributed in the groups. So what we see here, uh, you can look at these p-values. Indeed, venous thromboembolism was reduced in the apixaban group. Uh, the absolute difference here is about 5%. Uh, but on the other hand, the safety uh, variable, uh, major bleeding episodes, was also greater in the apixaban group. 
So what we have to look at is the number needed to treat uh, to do someone some good compared to the number needed to harm, which would result in increased bleeding. And if we look at these curves, actually thromboembolism in these patients was not very common. But indeed, there's a difference in the apixaban group compared to placebo that amounts to about 5%. Uh, the episodes were 7.3% in the placebo group and 1% in the apixaban group, so the difference is uh, about 6%. Um, and the number needed to harm major bleeding episodes were um, uh, occurred less in the placebo group compared to the apixaban group, uh, but the difference between the two here is less than, is about 2%. So we can calculate uh, and make a decision uh, whether or not this therapy is worthwhile. Uh, but indeed, apixaban reduced the primary um, variable in this study. There were less episodes of thrombosis although bleeding was increased. Uh, the next pay, uh, paper is the same story with rivaroxaban. You'll recall that apixaban has to be given twice a day. Rivaroxaban can be given once a day. Uh, this study here was very similar. Corana score patients of uh, greater, uh, two or greater. A uh, variety of tumors were represented here as in the first study. And the primary and secondary endpoints were the same. Uh, much to the chagrin of the sponsors, uh, the difference between rivaroxaban and placebo was barely not statistically significant. Bad luck for them. There's about a 4% difference here instead of a 5.5% difference as was seen in the other study. I don't believe that there's any theoretical difference between apixaban and rivaroxaban. Uh, the rivaroxaban sponsors had just had some bad luck in my view. And if we look at episodes of bleeding, these were also more common. The safety episode was more common in the Riva Roxaban group compared to placebo. Uh, these differences, however, were not statistically significant, uh, but there was a difference. So what do we do with these studies? Well, we can look at the editorial, and the editorialist was kind enough to calculate the number needed to treat compared to the number needed to harm. And as we mentioned earlier, uh, the number needed to treat is about as half as much as the number needed to harm. And although the statistical endpoints in these two studies were greater, I think uh, the advantage of taking one tablet a day instead of ha having to remember to take two tablets a day is a valid point. Uh, Rivaroxaban has to be adjusted for patients that have diminished renal function. We know all that. But you can look at these and if the number needed to treat to have an advantage here is somewhere between 24 and 40. Uh, and the number needed to harm is about not quite twice that number. So there seems to be some advantage of using these drugs to avoid thromboembolism in cancer patients. The next topic concerns a new aminoglycoside. Uh, it's called plasmycin. And you can look at the structure as seen here, the typical aminoglycoside, these uh, three sugars connected together and these free, three free amino groups. Uh, gentamicin also has three free amino groups. Aminoglycoside antibiotics operate by inhibiting the 30S ribosomal fraction in bacteria. They're very effective against gram-negative bacteria. And uh, the problem with these drugs concern nephrotoxicity and ototoxicity. We know all that. So in this first study, uh, it's a comparison of uh, plasmicin compared to meropenem for patients with severe complicated urinary tract infections, complicated in terms of what sort of bacteria is involved or complicated because of some anomalies in the lower urinary tract or the presence of urosepsis, et cetera. So here, and about 200 patients in each group were randomized to plasmicin compared to meropenem. And the idea here is to prove that plasmicin is no worse than meropenem. That's the design of this kind of study. And as we look here, there's hardly any difference between these two treatments. That's what the sponsors and the FDA requires. Uh, 
uh, if we look at uh, the differences, it looks as if plasmycin could be a little better than meropenem in terms of uh, curing these severe infections in these patients with complicated urosepsis. So if we look at subgroups here in terms of a forest plot, uh, we can see that uh, it looks, there's a tremendous amount of variability here in these uh, Specific items are not statistically different, uh, but it looks as if plasmycin could be a little better uh, than meropenem in these in these various subgroups. Now, if we look at um, adverse events, we're very interested in nephrotoxicity that occurred in seven percent in the plasma, uh, plasmycin group compared to four percent in the meropenem group. Uh, this difference was not statistically significant, although it goes in the direction that we would expect. Uh, no ototoxic differences were seen between these groups. Uh, one patient in each group uh, had some complaints of hearing loss. So it looks as if the side effects, the most dreaded side effect being uh, nephrotoxicity, uh, it is acceptable in the plasmycin-treated patients. Now, um, the non-inferiority in terms of efficacy was shown in this particular uh, study. Uh, we might be interested in patients with, that have gram-negative life-threatening infections elsewhere. And indeed, there was also a study uh, of pla plasmycin compared to um, colistin in patients that had enterobacterial infections that were resistant to carbapenem, which would be the drug of choice in today's parlance. Colistin is an ancient, introduced in 1959, polymyxin antibiotic, uh, which has a substantial toxicity, uh, but in patients that are carbapenem resistant, uh, there are a few other options. So in this particular study, the design was to compare plasmycin to colistin. And this study failed because not sufficient numbers of patients could be recruited, but the results were published anyway. Obviously, there's no statistical inference that can be achieved here. Uh, the idea was to show that plasmycin is no worse than colistin. That indeed seemed to be the case because cumulative probability of survival was better and the plasmycin looks more, at least it looks more better, it looks like a substantial different difference compared to the colistin group. And the increases in serum creatinine were substantially greater in the colistin group. Nephrotoxicity of this compound is, compound is known and uh, the degree of nephrotoxicity of plasmycin seemed to be acceptable. So this issue is also discussed here in an editorial in the New England Journal, and we clearly need additional antimicrobial developments. But plasmycin seems to be a novel aminoglycoside antibiotic that can be considered in patients that have life-threatening gram-negative bacterial infections that are resistant to other agents. The next topic uh, is again a topic that we also discussed yesterday. This is the idea of using an antibody drug conjugate to introduce a chemotherapeutic agent intracellular, intracellularly to, to cancer cells. And uh, this particular antibiotic, sasituzumab, uh, addresses trope 2, which is a transmembrane calcium signal transducer that's overexpressed in many cancer cells. And the attached drug conjugate in this case is a tropoisomerase inhibitor. Tropoisomerase inhibitor, uh, it's irinotecan, uh, which is attached to this antibiotic to sluice it inside of these cancer cells. Topo topoisomerases are enzymes that are involved in, in uh, wrapping DNA uh, which then has to be unwrapped for transcription to occur. Um, if you'll recall, uh, gyrase inhibitors that are used to treat bacterial infections are in principle also topoisomerases. So in this particular study, patients with triple negative breast cancer that have relatively few additional therapeutic options uh, were uh, 
not randomized, but all received this antibody attached to the topoisomerase inhibitor. So this is not a randomized trial. All the patients that had no other options were given this treatment. And the endpoint here was an inspection of progression-free survival, overall survival, and the occurrence of any sorts of toxicities. So if we look at these patients, most of them are obviously women, since it's about breast cancer, and they have uh, already been treated with a variety of uh, chemotherapeutic agents, uh, and they have uh, metastases to various additional sites, and they all received this antibody. So there are 108 patients that were given various cycles of satsatutumab attached to this topoisomerase inhibitor, and uh, there were some serious side effects, as we might expect, neutropenia, vomiting, nausea, diarrhea, and dyspnea in a few patients. But all in all, in terms of other options, um, these patients seem to accept this treatment. And if we look at the change in tumor size, this is a so-called waterfall diagram. Uh, tumors progressed in some patients, but since uh, this curve here is uh, skewed to the right, more patients seem to have had a clinical response or their disease remained stable for this period of treatment. And objective responses uh, as judged by the clinicians are shown here. And these were also variable, but some patients had a pretty reasonable um, objective response and the progression-free survival in these patients with no other options uh, at least uh, uh, seemed to be uh, addressed favorably. So if we look at the uh, efficacy in relationship to the aggressiveness of the clinical course, uh, the blue material is skewed to the right, so it appears that this uh, conjugated uh, drug conjugate to an antibody offers these patients an additional option. So, uh, satsa, this name that no one, uh, satsatutumab, uh, and uh, attached to this topoisomerase inhibitor, seems to give a response rate of about at least a third in these patients with triple negative breast cancer, diarrhea, and myelosuppression were the primary adverse events. The next study involves the notion that um, coronary artery disease uh, features um, uh, <clears throat> inflammation and an earlier study with kanakinumab that uh, neutralizes interleukin 1 beta gave a favorable result. Now the idea is, well, perhaps we can use some other form of in immunosuppression that's a lot more less expensive than uh, canakinumab. That was done here for reasons that to me are not entirely clear. We can discuss that later. But these patients with high risk uh, atherosclerosis uh, were randomized to methotrexate, which costs practically nothing, uh, compared to placebo and the idea that methotrexate, a uh, relatively nonspecific immunosuppressant, uh, might give the same kind of a salubrious result as did kanakinumab. Uh, that was done and no effect on the primary uh, uh, endpoint, uh, composite of non-fatal myocardial infarction, stroke, or cardiovascular death, we can look at these uh, box plots here, and there were, this was not an effective treatment, and there's no sign of any effect on any variable that was tested in this study. Uh, so the primary endpoints, not statistically significant. Secondary endpoints, you can forget those two. Uh, methotrexate did not help people with, at a high risk for coronary artery disease. So you can look at these, uh, these uh, endpoint slides here and the two groups lie on top of each other and no significant effects were seen. In terms of adverse events, methotrexate is not harmless and adverse events were seen and they were more common in the treatment group than in the placebo group, as one might expect, and also liver enzymes and other complications that are known to occur with methotrexate. So these patients did not benefit from this treatment. However, we should look at the details here 
And in the so-called Kanto study that involved this antibody against IL-1 beta, those people all had CRP levels of a mean of 4.2 milligrams per liter, uh, suggesting that they had an active underlying inflammation. Whereas in this second trial, uh, the CRP level in these patients was only 1.6 milligrams per liter, indicating that they had no evidence of active inflammation. So it's not clear to me why this study was done. Made the New England Journal anyway. Very good review in the New England Journal on initial care of the severely injured patient. Uh, this is a place where surgeons really shine. Um, in wartime, people have a high risk of being severely injured. And in uh, some inner cities, this is also the case. And what's discussed here is the application of tourniquets, uh, triaxamic uh, acid uh, to provide antifibrinolysis, uh, the strategy of permissive hypotension, discussion of the so-called golden hour, uh, what should be transfused in these patients, and the application of diagnostic ultrasonography by the physician on site, and also uh, the um, early temporary control of non-compressible hemorrhage uh, with an intra-arterial balloon. So these are the strategies that we'll discuss. The first thing is tourniquets. These have made a substantial comeback and there are excellent tourniquets that can be applied to stop bleeding in a, a Obviously, the injury here involves extremities, and uh, you'll observe that on these tourniquets, you always write the time of their application so that they're not left on too long. You would think that this would be digitalized by now, uh, but uh, tourniquets that have been around for hundreds of years are still uh, a very helpful method to uh, still bleeding on extremities until something more definitive can be done. That's discussed. Triaxamic acid has been for a, around for a long time. We'll look at a moment exactly how that fu functions. And the idea of permissive hypotension was actually introduced in World War I by the famous physiologist Walter Cannon. This strategy was left in the last 20 or 30 years with the rapid infusion of crystalloid fluids in these patients. But now this, there's been rethinking about this strategy and it might be better to still the bleeding, stop the bleeding and allow the patients to be a bit hypotensive until some definitive surgical procedure can be done. Uh, this is Walter Cannon. He was born in 1871 and died in, 18, in 1945. He was an amazing physiologist who was responsible for a whole variety of brilliant studies. He was sort of the American counterpart of Ernest Starling, uh, a famous British physiologist, one of his contemporaries. Uh, Walter Cannon actually went to the Western Front in World War I and studied shock. And a lot of what we know about shock was actually discovered by him be worthwhile to read some of his works. Uh, triaxamic acid uh, works by complexing to plasminogen so that the evolving thrombus is not dissolved. <coughs> We've looked at a variety of papers that involve triaxamic acid <coughs> as a prophylaxis to av avoid massive transfusions in coronary artery bypass surgery in patients uh, during delivery. Uh, in trauma patients, triaxamic acid is, has been verified by, by a whole variety of studies. It's basically a modification of epsilon amino caproic acid that's have been around for years for this effect. And triaxamic acid should be given to bleeding patients that have been severely injured. Damage control surgery. This is the strategy of um, doing operative procedures in stages. Can't fix everything at once so that the operations, each individual, the most important procedure is done in a timely fashion. And then the procedures that can be delayed 
by several hours or days or done at a later time instead of trying to fix everything at once. Uh, this idea of the golden hour was actually introduced also in World War I. Basically, this is the strategy of getting the severely injured patient to an operating theater as quickly as possible. Um, in the Vietnam conflict, uh, what was done is that uh, injured soldiers were evacuated with helicopters and the helicopters flew right over uh, the bat battalion aid station or the docks on the ground and flew to some aircraft carrier off the coast where operating theaters were available and the patients, uh, the patients could be evacuated and were operated, were inside some operating room within an hour. So that's what this term is concerning. The golden hour, don't go to a trivial hospital, uh, evacuate these people by helicopter to some sort of a trauma center where uh, skills are available to uh, save them instead of uh, having second rate people do it. Pre-hospital damage control is a Quick picture of the strategies here, how they should be applied and what sort of an order. Uh, the ideas of transfusion have been changed. Uh, putting in central lines is still reasonable, uh, but uh, bleeding patients need blood, not normal saline, not electrolyte solutions. They need blood and uh, blood, uh, whole blood as opposed to components. Uh, the surgeons authoring this article emphasize that point. Uh, ultrasonography, need to find out where the problem is. This should be done not by moving the patient to some radiographic center. Uh, the physicians on site have to be able to do this and uh, physicians should be trained in the so-called fast examination. That implies Focus, focused abdominal sonography for trauma, but including also the test at the chest to look to see if um, pleural effusions or hemothorax is present to examine the pericardium to make sure that um, a pericardial effusion or tamponade are not present. Examination of the uh, uh, abdomen looking particularly behind the liver and behind the spleen or to see if there's uh, free fluid in the peritoneal cavity. And I was interested to learn that uh, modern, ultra, uh, ultra modern, ultrasound uh, devices are now available where basically you have the ultrasound head and you can uh, visualize these things on your cell phone uh, to examine patients on the sidewalk to make therapeutic decisions. Uh, resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta we discussed several weeks ago. What this is about uh, is um, using this kind of technique uh, to stop bleeding on site in the artery that's involved. And uh, this procedure is abbreviated as REBOA, resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta. Now this uh, focused assessment with sonography and trauma, abbreviated FAST, here's an example of um, Looking at Morrison's pouch, fluid here indicates a problem, gives us the site where this occurs, directs the surgeon to where the problem is. Um, even if the, this examination is negative, as to there's some doubt about abdominal trauma, a peritoneal dialysis catheter for acute peritoneal dialysis can be placed. Uh, fluid can be moved in and out, and if the effluent is bloody, indicates some intra-abdominal pathology, directs the surgeon at where the problem is. So this is a pretty good review summarized here. And um, I would encourage you to read it if you have any <clears throat> interest in the acute treatment of uh, trauma patients. Short case in the New England Journal concerning pituitary hyperplasia and if the pituitary gland is driven by a failure of a secondary gland, such as the thyroid, the pituitary can increase in size considerably. Uh, optic chiasma can be uh, um, uh, involved here, causing visual field cuts. In this, this patient had severe hypothyroidism, 
And with treatment of the primary problem, uh, this pituitary hyperplasia, as you can see here on this MRI, uh, regressed appropriately. The patient in the New England Journal concerns a 29-year-old woman that has nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Uh, this spectrum of complaints also occurs in people that are exhibiting withdrawal from opioids, as we can learn here. Uh, this patient has had a variety of chronic problems over a period of years. 13 months ago, she fell asleep while in her automobile. Uh, she was a, assessed in a sleep lab and exhibited low normal daytime sleepiness. Apparently, the reasons for the sleepiness were not obvious at the time. It turns out that she's treated with omeprazole, Veronicline, uh, naproxen, and cyclobenzaprine, don't even know what these things are, uh, but also receives hydrocodone uh, uh, paracetamol, cause some nausea. Further history includes that uh, she's been at a psychology clinic where she admitted to using illicit drugs, marijuana, or oral opioids, cocaine, and methamphetamine since she was in middle school. Uh, five years ago, she tried to stop some of these things, but basically uh, she's had escalating amounts of oxycodone to satisfy cravings and prevent withdrawal symptoms. She spends $3,000 a month on oxycodone alone. This is inconceivable. So with a careful history and uh, coaxing this information out of this patient, uh, this history was then obtained. So this is a basically a drug addict to various things. Uh, she was screened at this particular uh, visit to the doctor and her urine was positive for oxycodone, buprenorphine, apparently somebody's been trying to help her withdraw from these things, and other agents, including cocaine, but her saliva, and these things can be measured in saliva, serum, or urine, uh, was at least negative for fentanyl. So there was one negative result in this patient. So the discussion is, what do we do here? Well, if she's had this problem since middle school, I would think the prognosis is probably Gardner. And we can th consider naltrexone, methadone, buprenorphine, uh, the risk for relapse, high, opportunities for improving care, I guess. Uh, she's been to multiple institutions in the past. And uh, what are the next steps and what are the final diagnoses? I guess that physicians have some fault in this entire scenario. And in my view, uh, the pain racket needs to be addressed because the next discussion in the New England Journal concerns a topic called structural iatrogenesis. Might ask yourself what that means. Iatrogenic diseases are caused by physicians. Well, that's true, I think, in part, but the patients have some fault in this too. So uh, the problem concerns a 43-year-old man with rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is painful. Um, it's not written in any constitution, to my knowledge, not in the U.S. Constitution or in the German Constitution, that life is guaranteed to be pain-free. But about 30 years ago, uh, this scale was introduced where the patients are allowed to check how much they suffer. My experience only encompasses 50 years, but the patients that I encountered always lie between 6 and 10. Whoever says, I am only a three, doc, I don't really know why I'm here, I'm going to go home. They never say that. So physicians prescribe oxycodone, which has been marketed with incredible skills and success. So that's what happened to this patient. And then we can discuss, th this is called structural atrogenesis, and it indicates that the physician's have a certain fault here, bureaucratic systems, etc., and how to deal with this problem. And in this discussion, there was no real solution either, but all physicians encounter these patients and we need to know something about it. Here's a quiz question for you. 
which of the following diagnoses is most likely for a patient with the suddenly has a spinning sensation, nausea, vomiting, and unsteady gait. I'm not an expert on this problem, but basically I was taught the worse the symptoms, the more trivial the cause. And patients that have these paroxysmal episodes, uh, this is not cerebellopontine contusion. That would be evident from history. This is not a fractured temporal bone. This is not a traumatic dislocation of the stapes because that features deafness instead of dizziness. Uh, vestibular neuritis, I guess, is possible. But here again, I wouldn't ex expect these paroxysms. And um, so this is benign paroxysm, uh, paroxysmal positional vertigo. And you can maneuver the patient to see if you can get the the little ossicles back to where they belong. There are maneuvers here that we teach the students how to deal with benign paroxysmal vertigo, and that's the correct answer here. The first topic in the Lancet concerns prenatal exome sequencing analysis in infants where the ultrasound examination in utero identifies a particular structural developmental problem. Now, this is uh, highly unfortunate, but at any rate, that was a question here. There'd been an earlier study looking at uh, children that were born dead to see whether or not, other than chromosomal abnormalities, to see if there were genetic defects that might be associated with their problem and uh, an approach using exome sequencing and a genetic defect was identified in about 20% of these poor, unfortunate patients. Now, in this study, uh, uh, this sequencing was done while the patients were still in utero. So what was done here is um, if the ultrasound examination indicated there was a severe problem, and if chromosomal analysis was unremarkable, then DNA was after due consent was extracted from both parents and fetal DNA was obtained from chorionic villi, amniotic fluid or um, uh, fetal blood and exome sequencing across the entire genome was applied. And then the authors looked to see what would fall out. And indeed, uh, there were positive findings and a whole list of um, um, mutations are listed here, uh, but if we, uh, uh, these figures are, are indicate how many of these pregnancies were terminated or how many were uh, born prematurely or born dead and how many were live births, et cetera, that's shown here. But basically they found abnormal mutations in 8.5% of the cases, which is a yield, which was less than this autopsy study. And I would think, is not very encouraging that this kind of procedure should be done in these patients if the ultrasound examination is abnormal. Uh, but the authors uh, were unperturbed by my opinion. Uh, the, the next patient paper in The Lancet was the same story done somewhere else, and the end result was also about 8%. So although uh, this exome sequencing action uh, identifies uh, genetic causes of structural anomalies in fetuses more than cytogenetics or chromosomal microarray array alone. In my view, I thought the results were fairly modest uh, given the cost of these procedures and the idea, and lastly, the conclusion that little can be specifically done for these patients anyway. The next topic in the Lancet is uh, uh, which drug is best for generalized anxiety? Patients that go to physicians that have um, panic attacks and anxious, and uh, this is a common complaint. And if the physician decides to prescribe a drug, which one should it be? So a meta-analysis was done. And since all of these are randomized controlled trials, the placebo group here, of course, is massive, and that's why the placebo circle is the greatest.
Here are benzodiazepines. Here is bupro, uh, bupropione and uh, various other drugs that I'm not really familiar with, but everything that's ever been given for anxiety is listed on this slide. And then we look at the results. And there are some things that are helpful for anxiety, but there aren't very many. And a lot of these things are useless for anxiety. So that's the value of this report. So we're left with um, pregabalin, venlafaxine. Can't even pronounce these things. Uh, benzodiazepines, Valium, et cetera, uh, were actually not mentioned by these authors and presumably are therefore less helpful. Uh, the next study involves these opioid addicts and buprenorphine, a depot injection at various doses and regimens was compared to placebo in this very large trial. And the end point was um, uh, how often is the urine negative for oxycodone in these patients if they're given buprenorphine and are encouraged to stop their habit. And it looks like buprenorphine at two different doses and at two different regimens seem to be about equally effective and certainly beat placebo. Although uh, relapse amongst these patients uh, achieved abstinence per percent, 100 percent abstinence, not that great in terms of numbers of participants and patients, but it beats placebo. And if we look, green is a urine negative, red is uh, they're cheating on us. And uh, cheating was more common with placebo compared to buprenorphine. But this is no cure for this problem. But it does show up with more greens than placebo. So it looks like there's some hope for this treatment. And if we look at um, uh, craving or Verlangen in German, uh, craving was reduced with buprenorphine. And there are various scales for this and blood levels were measured. And uh, the lower dose of buprenorphine seemed to be as effective as the higher dose. So it looks like this is a strategy that we can apply to help people with opioid addiction. Then the review in Lancet is wonderful. I had to look to see what this meant. Syndemic, the global syndemic. And a syndemic is a synergistic epidemic. And we're talking about the synergism between obesity, undernutrition, and climate change. Hey, this review includes about everything on the planet that's bad. Climate change and obesity and malnutrition. So you can look at the key messages and I'll let you inspect these on your own. Um, and then uh, the authors discuss uh, global malnutrition and high systolic blood pressure, that's bad. Tobacco, also bad. Glucose, also bad. And then uh, the socio-demographic index, we've talked about that. That's a variable that has to do with education. Uh, the um, uh, uh, number of children that the women have and various things of this nature uh, and the, uh, how rich the countries are, uh, socio-demographic index. So, uh, high socio-demographic uh, socio index doesn't seem to protect from these, from these problems, although in these areas, tobacco plays a greater role. And uh, low middle socio-demographic index, uh, at least uh, high BMI also occurs in these areas. And then the discussion is about the right to well-being and the right to food and the right to health and all of these rights the authors might have included some responsibilities in this review. And you can look at the global outcomes in these vortices of storm and drang. Uh, all that's discussed here. And uh, then we can look at, uh, I focus here on high income English speaking countries, female obesity, body mass index greater than 30, a third of them, uh, malnutrition considerably less, uh, a gross domestic product, not bad. And then I had to look up what 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 is a Gini coefficient? And we learned that it's a statistical measure uh, to examine the inequality 
uh, of the distribution of goods. So there's even that. So you can inspect that at your leisure, uh, but it doesn't seem to and retard this young man of uh, working on socio-demographic index, I suppose. Then the last topic, as we can see from this strongly negative double birefringence here, we're talking about amyloidosis, which is the deposit of beta pleated sheets and fibrils that are basically extremely insoluble. And this occurs in numerous tissues of the body. And we're talking about transthyrotretine, also known as prealbumin, which does bind to thyroxin. And that's why it's called transthyrotine. This is in essence a acute phase protein that also increases under conditions of inflammation and its structure doesn't look it doesn't look like crp but then it kind of does uh, so this is a, an innate immune response protein and if there are mutations in that then people get amyloidosis however amyloidosis can occur from transthyrotine even if transthyrotine is not mutated then the second topic in this case concerns Popeye. And this is a comic figure from the United States from the 1930s. And Popeye is muscular. But you'll observe that his lower forearms are what's muscular and his biceps are not particularly remarkable. When he eats spinach, he, he gets even stronger. He has a girlfriend. Her name is Olive. Her last name is Oil. So her name is Olive Oil. So that's Popeye and Olive Oil. And the case concerns Popeye's sign, heart disease, and amyloidosis. I think these authors should look at the cartoon because what they're talking about is a ruptured biceps tendon, which causes the biceps muscle to contract. But the biceps muscle is in the uh, upper uh, portion of the uh, of the arm and not in the lower portion of the arm and it doesn't really fit uh, the cartoon so Popeye is not really is not really correct uh, but this patient also ha has spontaneous rupture of the biceps tendon which is a rare complication of amyloidosis and also has heart failure and uh, the type of amyloidosis here is indeed transthyrotine although this patient did not have a mutation You'll recall that we recently looked at a paper in the New England Journal concerning a compound called tafamidis, and tafamidis functions as a chaperone that stabilizes correctly, uh, incorrectly folded tetrameric uh, forms of transthyrotine. And it, that's a promising treatment for amyloidosis. I'm sure similar compounds are being developed for other forms of amyloidosis. But this has to be given before the patient reads, uh, develops uh, biceps tendon rupture or heart failure. That's it for this week. If you want to hear all this in German, you can stick around for 10 minutes. But otherwise, please join me tomorrow. And we're going to do the next New England Journal for March 6th. Thank you for your attention. Ich mache es aber gerne. Und 